Today on the podcast, we talk to someone called Crypto Hustle, or otherwise known as Gray Jabisi. He has over 200,000 subscribers on YouTube and many, many more on other social medias. And there's one other also very interesting thing about him. He's a Bitcoin maxi. I do hope you enjoy this video. We get into a little bit of back and forth about XRP and Bitcoin. I hope you find it interesting. Let's get into it. I also want to say thank you to BitGet who let me use their offices in Dubai to film this podcast. Okay, so we haven't talked much. Yeah. Uh, but I'd love to know what you're all about, who you are, tell our audience what they can expect from you. Jeez, man, that's that's a very tough question. <laughs> I think you should start easy on me on, on like on the podcast. Um, so where do I begin? Like I'm a crypto trader. I am a an investor. I mean, look, a nutshell is like I'm one of those people that their life their life was saved by cryptocurrency, and I've just been in it since. You know. When so did, when did that serving start? About eight years ago. So my life changed completely. Three sixty. I had I have no college degree whatsoever. I was broke, like in Africa, and I didn't had any money, and I didn't had any other opportunities. It was it was until. I came across crypto that my life basically found a direction. So before crypto, I was earning, I was a gardener cutting people's grass, uh, and I was earning about maybe four to five hundred dollars a month maximum, right? And then when I got introduced to crypto, my income level moved from like that level to like two thousand five hundred dollars a month. And then I started trading and all and all, and in a few years, I became a millionaire from cryptocurrency. So it's just like one of those great stories that makes a lot, a lot of people to believe that this actually is an opportunity for a lot of us. So what was the first crypto that you got into? Bitcoin, of course. I'm hearing that all the time. Yeah, 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 exactly. Why, why Bitcoin? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question that for people who are getting into crypto right now, they think that there, is an, there are options. And it's scary to me when I see people who they, ha they say that they invested in crypto and they have a whole bunch of cryptos. They don't even own any Bitcoin. I think it's kind of a thing now it happens. But when I was getting into crypto, there was a lot more solid education about what crypto is. So everybody understood that, okay, if you're going to invest in crypto, you need to have Bitcoin. It must be at least 60% of your portfolio minimum or whatever. So a lot of the Bitcoin maxis were there teaching, basically installing the Bitcoin mindset inside your head. And I think now that is co completely out of the window. Only a few people are able to learn it, learn it. The way people are understanding it now is the hard way. They fuck around and they find out later that, oh shit, I had all this bunch of shit coins. Now they all just disappeared. And then they have to start from phase one, like three years later, which is bad. Do you think that it's tough for people to learn now because it's a bear market? No, it's not that it's a bear market, but it's just that that, it, that becomes uh, on the interest level. But I, I think the popularity of the bull market kind of helps for people to learn, but they learn the, the wrong lessons. The, most people who become successful in crypto basically learn it in the bear market when there's nothing interesting and they're investing in the long term saying that, okay, one day maybe it will go up, right? But those who buy because it's on CNN and CNBC and all-time highs, those guys get hammered. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It's like the, the, it's amazing to me how that actually happens to where the absolute worst moment to buy is when yeah. everyone buys. It, yes. it, when you take the whole population of crypto, yeah. It's, fa it's fascinating. You have to kind of go through that mm -hmm. to learn that that's not what you do. And then you're in the club. Yes. Um, but it's a, a rare occasion where someone can get in at the right time as a beginner. Mm -hmm. But I also think you learn. I, I've, I've had this whole thing on in my mind. I wanted to make lots of content about it. But it was, it was along the lines of observing the markets mm -hmm. for a considerably longer time than anyone else does mm. before investing because you can make the argument now and say any anything you throw throw the dart at the dartboard everything's probably going to go, go up. up yes it's going to rise with the flood um but it's it's, it's just fascinating the the psychology of when people choose to come in versus when is actually the right time i think it's 
so funny. But did you come in at the wrong time? I know no, it was, no, no, it was so, long enough ago to where it's yes. worked, but at that time, what was it? Yeah, so look, the, the time I was getting into cryptocurrency, it wasn't the same as now, where like right now it's very popular, everybody knows it. And I got into it because of a real use case. So for me, it was like I had no bank account. Banks couldn't open an account for me because I didn't qualify to have a bank account. Apparently, you need to have a, a source of income as a job or whatever, or you need to have a student card to prove that you're a student to get a student account. I didn't have those. So I would go online to find work and I would find jobs, but people would struggle to pay me because I didn't have a PayPal account. PayPal wasn't working in Africa, that, you know, in the area that I was at. So Bitcoin was the only solution to get into it. Mm -hmm. So I started working online and getting paid in Bitcoin. And then I just started holding those coins. And the more I, and a funny story about it is that the other day I was like, okay, I need to try if this thing actually can, is real. Can I get the first question that everybody asks, how do I cash out the Bitcoin into real money, right? So I took the, a little bit of BTC, put it on a website called Local Bitcoins to sell it. And I was being offered a lot more money than the price point, the market value, right? So that's when I started to realize that, wait, this thing is actually a big deal. And then I started digging deeper and deeper. And then I ended up selling my car, bought more Bitcoin, moved out of my apartment to buy more Bitcoin. And I basically scaled down my life to, inv to get enough money to invest in Bitcoin. And then, you know, yeah, in the long run, it works out. So what, what, what in your mind is the use case of Bitcoin? It depends on who you ask, right? So Bitcoin is both a currency a store of value, but also it's a payment network. You can do both. So for someone in the UK, it's more likely a speculative asset because they don't understand why they need to use it when they can use PayPal and banks and, and what have you. For someone in Venezuela, is basically an escape route from the traditional currency that is plummeting. Uh, you know, it's hyperinflated. For someone in Zimbabwe, is a means to send money out of the country because there's no any other uh, quicker means of doing this. To other people who fully understand it, like you and me, it's probably all of these things in total. And for people who value freedom, like myself, I look at Bitcoin as uh, a passport to the global economic system because I was born and raised in Africa. When people in Europe and in the US were investing in, in Amazon and Google and all these big stocks that made a lot of people rich, the tech bubble, we had no access to that market. But now I have access to the same market that those, that those, guy, those guys have because it's now on the blockchain. So, you know, Bitcoin to me means all these things together. Mm. Yeah. I had a theory, uh, I heard a th theory the other yeah. day about how at a certain point of Bitcoin mining, it takes too much energy mm. to mine, at which point the the network would collapse or something like that. It was like a mm -hmm. it, that like the the move into QFS. Yes. What what can you tell me about that? What they're referring to is that so right now you get a block reward for mining Bitcoin, and that number is increasing every two hundred and ten thousand blocks. But then what will happen when we have reached to close to zero, where you're not producing, you're not making any money per block? Well, Bitcoin then becomes mining simply because settling of transactions and you generate income from transaction fees. But also, you know, this is technology. It evolves, it changes their updates, right? So there will be, I'm sure, economic models that allows for people to still benefit from it. Another interesting thing is, Bitcoin has always been known to be like a payment layer, right? That's all it does. It's just a, a currency protocol. But now you have things like ordinals, which are growing really fast. Over 1,700 Bitcoins have now been burned in as transaction fees on the network. All that money is going back to, to the miners. So you can see that as the Bitcoin layer expands, more economic value is added to the chain and then miners are even now able to make more money. I do think that if the ordinal and BRC20 aspect of it grows, even after the halving that's coming soon, Bitcoin miners are still going to be making more money. Mm. Yeah. 
who do you, who do you think is going to benefit most from the transactions of Bitcoin? Because it doesn't seem like institutions would have the best use for it. Institutions would have the best use for it. For example, like a an XRP token mm. on, on the Ripple, on the XRPL. Yeah. They've geared that whole blockchain towards specifically institutional payments. And sure. it seems to be going that way with the partnerships and or, or whatever you want to talk about. It doesn't seem like in that capacity as a payment, I'm also not involved in Bitcoin really at all in mm -hmm. that world or anything. Right. So please tell me if, if this is not the case. It mm -hmm. doesn't seem like Bitcoin's being used for large scale value transfer. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting question because it speaks to the view that you have where you place institutions and say governments, for example, in some kind of light where they're more important for things to work yes. or to, to adapt. Uh, they have to adapt something for it to scale and to become more valuable, right? But that in the Bitcoin space, that has been proven to be wrong. It's actually the opposite. So something like Bitcoin is growing really fast, regardless of whether institutions and governments have been pushing it back. And if you look at projects that scale and that become successful are the ones that have very little to do with institutions and government, which are, you could call it in technical terms, the, the ones that are more centralized, like Repo, you have given an example. Look at how it struggled. Repo has been around since 2013. A lot of people don't know that. I can tell you a story about this. I've, uh, I've shared this on multiple podcasts, but there was a time where I was getting into crypto, Repo was already around, and then I was looking at the price. I'm like, wow, look at Bitcoin. It's like, what, 600 or something? And then Repo is less than a dollar. Maybe the smart thing to do is to buy more Repo because it's banks and governments. By the time it reaches up to Bitcoin, I'll become super rich because we're hearing about story of people who bought Bitcoin at $5 or less than a dollar. And I was like, I'm never going to have that chance. Maybe Repo is the way to go. So I sold a good amount of my Bitcoin for XRP. I was like, I'm going to kill it. And I realized years went by, Repo just was being outperformed by Bitcoin. Luckily, I ended up selling the XRP for Ethereum when it came out. And that I was able to outperform Bitcoin with that investment, which ended up really well. But I also know people who entered the crypto market right at the same time as myself. And they invested in Ripple because these were like, sophisticated investors they know about the markets and they say bitcoin doesn't make sense repo has a real life use case they invested in it to this day they haven't made any money yeah that's a problem with yeah so eight years eight years in xrp you haven't made any life-changing returns it's crazy it's being outperformed by a high market cap coin like bitcoin if that's not a scam then you have to explain to me what it is because I can give another example of that, what you alluded to. So the most regulated exchange in crypto to ever exist was FTX. Look what happened. So just because you have institutional stamps and government stamps doesn't really make it safe or secure or more robust. You could actually argue that it makes it weaker in this space because it's a very high volatile. The technical aspect of things have to be more solid than the flowers mm -hmm. yeah it's tough being an xrp i will say that much. there you go i think you're in xrp i am very heavily <laughs> very heavily um sorry sorry to hear <laughs> no I, I'm, I'm i think i'm i think i'm very well placed but what i'm pa paper would have been a better investment for you well if i want yeah to get more money in a short term then mm -hmm. yeah a meme coin is you know maybe that's maybe that's the way to go um i don't know i just I feel like there's a lot of things when, when it's like a dark side of crypto. Mm. And I, I think that XRP and Ripple are on the dark side of crypto. If you define crypto as a way for finance to be decentralized. Mm -hmm. So in that context, Bitcoin being decentralized, all the, all the ones that I, I think a lot of people <laughs> here have been kind of talking about the, the tokens, they, they go to the true nature of crypto, mm -hmm. which is decentralization, power to the individual. XRP and Ripple 
is a different mindset and it's more towards regulation. You're kind of on the dark side. You kind of want regulation to come in because if the SEC are coming after a specific token, usually when the SEC come after a to- or a, a company, it's usually good news for the price of that, mm. that company. It's usually like a rite of passage. But in investing in XRP, you're also accepting that actually this isn't about the decentralization for us. It's it's about something else, mm-hmm. almost trying to ride the wave of regulation. But that right. isn't to the true nature of crypto. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you, we, we can talk about regulation. So when you hear regulation, what do you think regulation is for? And because you say like Ripple in the traditional word is what is in the light side of finance, right? Bitcoin is actually the dark side. Yes. Right? Yeah, exactly. But what makes, what do you think regulation is good? I think it's good for companies like Ripple. No, but it's good. For, it's good for companies. Yeah. But is it good for investors, for people, like individuals? Um, if you catch it before the regulation, afterwards, it's a nightmare. Like what, I, what I'm saying is what comes after this, mm. after regulation is no opportunity for anyone. Okay. All right. That's what comes after, but there's a right, there's a wave to ride mm-hmm. on that journey. And I think the, the mental, the, the framework that we're all working on in this XRP community is that the money, the people who run the money, mm. they're going to make as much money as they can. So if we look at the solutions to the, to the problems that they have, yeah. there's going to be money made in that journey. But what we often lose sight of is that there's actually opportunity to make money before all of that, like, mm. like you guys are doing, right. um, that we miss out on because we're focused so much on riding this wave, um, fully acknowledging that afterwards it's going to be like CBDCs, surveillance, mm. like loss of sover- sovereignty, 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 sovereignty. I always yeah. say that wrong. Um, so we like know this, but it also blinds us from everything that's happening in Dubai. Like everyone making money here, they're not they're not waiting on XRP. <laughs> I think when you when you say that to me, it almost feels like you put so much trust and belief in regulators. So let me ask you a question: Have you ever have you ever seen a regulator or a politician and? your reaction to them being, wow, that guy is really smart. No. Thank you. So I think there is something to be said about that then, right? Because this is a fast moving wheel, right? And you have to be nimble and fast and smart enough to figure it out and to make sure that um, from a game theory perspective, you win. And I don't, so if you don't think of most regulators as smart, so what makes you think that you win? Because I know who they're out to serve. Okay. I know exactly who they're out to serve, the already rich people in the traditional system. Sure. So it's like a known thing. Mm. I know that they're, they're, they don't know what they're talking about because right. we get so into the weeds on crypto and blockchain yes. that we know what's happening and what's coming. Mm. They don't seem to know, but they do know how they can position themselves to most best affect them and their peers so it's a power game right yes. they'll play the power technique to align themselves with the big rich people the elite but now from that game theory to a retail investor so this is maybe some advice to repo investors <laughs> in a game theory of ripple you only the top guys will win the elites I think it's a lot of people delude themselves that, oh, if Ripple wins, then they win too. No, you, you're you better off trading other things that are not highly centralized, that are completely decentralized because you have a chance to buy in and uh, gain the m- maximum return on investment. Another example of bad investments for retail is this. There have been new projects recently that launched, Aptos, Sui, and all that kind of stuff. The last trend of layer two solutions and tokens have been coming out of the VC realm of Silicon Valley and all that, right? But how many people really made life-changing money from those projects? Very little. Because most of these projects were selling tokens in pre-sales to VCs. By the time they launch on Binance and centralized exchanges, they're dumping on the 
investors. So this is the same fate that is faced by repo investors. It's not that XRP doesn't really make money for early investors because it was an early insider selling kind of deal. Those guys, they make a lot of money. Maybe they sell 200 million every year or something like that. They, that's what happened in 2021. But for anyone who just invested waiting for a 20x, you're in for a bad time. But for a, hot, for a guy at the top who has a lot of repo tokens, XRP tokens, for them, it's like, well, they just need enough liquidity, a lot of people to hold and buy into it for them to dump on you because they bought their tokens for nothing. Whereas you're going there to buy them at 80 cents, mm. right? So if you understand things like this, you, you, a lot of people hate things like meme coins, right? They say, oh, it's a, oh, it's a shit coin. But those ones are actually much more geared towards if you entered early on those projects, you're more likely to make money but you know that they will also collapse at least. Yeah. So from a game theory perspective, you know the game you're playing and at least you can position yourself to win. On the XRP investment, it's just very difficult. It is difficult, I, right. won't, I won't deny. But also the definition of early changes yeah. from person to person. Yeah. Uh, Cause if you're looking at partnerships for the future and the, the regulation and stuff, that's mm. down the line. So in that capacity, we're early. If you define it, this is early, you could make that case. Um, but certainly th there seems to have been some weird things that happened at the beginning of Ripple. Mm -hmm. And th there was documents released recently that, that allude to that a fact that that's all going to come out to the surface. Mm -hmm. um, but we are most adamant. I think oftentimes it's like, like that. We're, and I, I'm understanding that now I'm coming to like a broader audience that's kind of seeing what everyone thinks. Um, I think w I, I, I think we've got good reason that we're focused on what we're focused on, mm. um, but it doesn't help to stay like that. You, I think you're scared of freedom. Like you want to take your funds and you want to put it in, uh, in the hands of someone else and say, they have to do right by me. You're saying that, no, I don't want to take my investment and be in control and look around what's going on and invest, that's too much risk for me. But I want to put it in the hands of people that I feel I'm safe and then they have the power to basically... So what you're saying is that Ripple has too much power to win and then you become successful because you're an investor. But if, if you did, if in the last five years you took your money out of Ripple, and made decisions on your own to invest in something else, you could have probably made more money. That's obvious, right? I don't, yeah, I don't deny that. Right. But you're saying that you're scared to do that yourself and then you're putting your trust in an institution. The same as putting money in the bank or in some kind of investment. Uh, so I mostly agree, mm. uh, but it's more about, as I said earlier, investing in something where I know who the beneficiaries of that are. Mm -hmm. And historically, there's always a transitionary period where some people who, who know what's coming, like the like the internet. Yeah. There's some normal people that realize this is going to be quite big, and they yeah. invested. Yeah. Um. I, that's kind of how I view that. But in this case, I I just know even if it's corrupt, even if there's a power mm. thing, at least I know who's going to benefit, and maybe that knowledge allows me to ride that wave. But hmm. it's not to the true nature of crypto it's not about the true nature uh, right now i'm speaking purely from a pnl perspective like return on investment. I, I know i know i so, can't argue with you on that you, so, you win so so let's look at that and say okay cool you believe that okay this as a company is well positioned to do better that's what you're saying right x repo is well positioned to do better as a company yes but you're not invested in the company though you invested you invested in a token xrp i hold XRP, which has no attachment to the entity itself. So what you're saying is right, that repo can actually become successful as a company, right? But then you invested in something other than the company itself. So these are two different, two different things. Another way to explain it is this, the SEC lawsuit can destroy XRP, the token, but repo, the company can survive. I, I don't think so. Well, like repo still works right now. Yeah, but I think XRP continues to do what it's supposed, like its utility, regardless of how it's, if it's a security or not. It's yeah, but, but it's, it's, a, it's just a token. It can have no economic value and the blockchain would still function. 
it's not a gas fees like on Ethereum where it's actually you need it. You know, it's R Ripple is just a, a centralized blockchain that doesn't really need a token. That's why the SEC is even questioning why, you know, is this a security or not? They don't know. Yeah, I also, I, I also think that that process of defining it as a security or mm. not is a right of passage. Okay, but then... Because lots, of, lots of big companies have gone through that. Sure, but, but then at the end, let's just say if XRP doesn't make it, Ripple will stay. And the people who invested in Ripple, the company, they are the beneficiary because they made money from the retail investors like you and I or everyone who invested in Ripple before. But they, those guys never have to benefit anything. It's not a stock. You don't own Ripple stock. You own a token. Whereas when you own Bitcoin, you own the currency itself. When you own Ethereum, you actually own the utility token of the blockchain, which is a fundamental part of making Ethereum to work. Yeah. Repo is not really like that. There's a company and then there is the token. But the token has utility. So you could say I'm holding well, it for the same can, reason. Can Binance operate without BNB token? Yes. Thank you. I think that answers everything. So if Binance can operate or can BitGet operate without the BitGet token? Yeah. Yeah. So there's com these are completely two different things. There, there's the company and the entity, and then there's the token. All these tokens are referred to as utility tokens, but it's just in the name. It, they don't really serve any fundamental need in the blockchain or in the functionalities of all these entities. Mm. It's an interesting, interesting thought. I know a lot of XRP guys are going to hate me for this. But You're going to get massive <laughs> hate on this video. I'm used to it, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I, I want to know, because I know we're in limited time. Yeah. What is, what's got you most excited right now? Right now, I'm super excited about Ordinos uh, in the uh, blockchain crypto space. And on the other side, I'm spending more time in Africa working on uh, education to maximize the adoption of crypto. But also I'm working on another project um, using Starlink to basically give access, internet access to as many people as possible to places where they had never seen internet before. So cool. Those, yeah, those How does that work logistically? What do, you, what do you have to go and do? So I made some videos before on my page. You could see I was in the middle of the Zambezi River somewhere in the jungle with elephants and stuff, but I had really good internet connection. So how it works is basically if you have, if you're in an area with coverage, with Starlink, all you need is that antenna to set it up. You can put it on the floor or on the roof and you got full-time internet, like unlimited and it's fast enough for you to stream do whatever you create content and all that so. and what's the desired effect of, of putting that in places that didn't have the internet so think of people who go to university today but they don't even have any internet access they do these things by the books and all that or if they have internet access it's only on their mobile phone so the activity in how they interact with the cyberspace it's very limited because imagine you send someone a five minute video on their WhatsApp. And let's say the size of this video is 80 megabytes. This video is really important that it might help them make money to change their life. But they will look at the size of this video and they'll be like, screw it. It's 81 megabytes. It would take me forever to download. Number two, it's also expensive. So they're just going to pass it by. Exactly right. So you can see that the economic behaviors are also influenced by how much internet access you have or how affordable it is. So I think having things like Starlink internet in these spaces is a massive game changer because it accelerates other things like crypto itself too, because most people are now be able to spend more time to watch this podcast in full and hear us talk about XRP and whether it's a security or not, is it good, whatever, and then actually get real education. Yeah. So my space is education. I founded Crypto University, and this internet thing we're doing with CGU in Africa is um, a very big part of it as well. It's, That's really cool. Yeah, it ties into the education thing. It's the it's almost the philanthropic uh, side of things that I think we all need to do at some point you know what what's funny though it's like it's not philanthropic in a way that 
you're just giving free money away. It's not charity, right? But it's something that, let's say if you want to expand, if you want crypto to grow, you want South America, Africa, and all these spaces to adopt it. But you can't do it without the internet. So you put the internet in, it just has the desired effect of growing the network effects of it, right? Yeah. So actually, if you think about it, it's, it's economical. It's not even um, philanthropic yeah. because you're growing the economic pie by giving people access to the global economy. Super cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, where can people find you if they want to I'm tell you the XRP is the king? And <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can come, all you the XRP people, you can come and attack me on my YouTube channel. It's called Crypto Hustle. It has more than 200,000 subscribers on it. Uh, I've been talking about crypto there since like 2015 or something on the channel. And uh, I'm on Twitter, Instagram as Gray BTC, G R E Y BTC. Gray BTC, not Gray XRP. It's a difference. <laughs> okay. And my username is now Gray XRP. There's direct competition. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Cheers, mate.